floor for questions. So uh, go go ahead, gentlemen. Uh, kia ora, uh, Koto, as we would say here. Um, um, welcome and um, thank you so much for joining us uh, at Sparrows on a Monday morning. Um, I think both Nick and I are night owls, so in the in the in the avian world, we're actually probably more comfortable than you are. <laughs> so uh, anyway, much appreciated. Also, we just wanted to uh, say a, a word about Lee Howarth, who some of you may remember very well, who's now at the Cawthorn Institute, and it was through um, us working with Lee on this project that that he suggested that we we chat to you. So um, Lee, if you're out there, thank you very much. I think he was planning to join, but I, I don't know if he's online. Um, um, so yes, Nick and I would just like to take you through um, a project where we, we've been running here over the past couple of months in New Zealand called uh, Navigating Future Uncertainty Adaptation Pathways for the New Zealand Seafood Sector. And Lee thought we should give you a, a talk because um, he had been working in a similar sort of field with you, I think. Um, so he thought there might have a lot, a lot of um, interesting commonalities and, and comparisons to make between us. Um, so um, I'll kick off and then Nick and I will, will sort of tick, uh, tick tag or whatever the word is, tag team through through this presentation, which should take about 25 minutes. So I hope that's OK, Gregor. Um, so, uh, when are you going to move? Uh, OK, here we go. Uh, so we're just going to talk quickly about what are adaptation pathways. Um, and then uh, Nick's going to give you some examples of how he's used adaptation pathways for agriculture here. And then we'll talk about the project and how we've applied that thinking to fisheries and aquaculture. And then just a couple of uh, quick thoughts because we've only, we've only just finished or are finishing this project. So we're, we're, we've just got a few uh, very um, nascent ideas about lessons learned and next steps, which we'd love to discuss with you uh, through some questions afterwards. So um, first of all, what are adaptation pathways? Um, I'm sure you've all seen pictures like this, uh, graphs like this, um, which seems to be part of our daily lives now, which is probably a good thing. Um, but what, what's um, inherent in all of these projections of, of global temperatures and, and climate changes is the uncertainty in the models, particularly after mid-century and even leading up to mid-century. So um, it's, it's very easy, I think, for people to assume that the future is certain when it comes to climate change. But depending what what our policy responses are let alone the 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 various errors and assumptions in the models there is actually a huge range of outcomes that could could potentially um come about um and while we can use some of these projections obviously to think about direct impacts on the ecosystems that underpin our primary industries um, and that's where i think in the past a lot of the science has really been looking um, you have to remember that there's going to be a massive change uh, one way or the other to policy and, and policy environments related to climate change, whether that's taxing carbon, uh, green fuels coming on the market, um, changes in consumer behaviour and consumer preferences, all of which will affect markets of one, one kind or another and therefore the economics within which our industries are, are, are operating. So. It, I think it's important to remember always that it's not just about the direct ecological or biophysical impacts that we're concerned about, but also the broader policy and um, economic impacts and responses of climate change. And then, of course, as we have all remember through bitter experience, and we don't seem to talk about it anymore, we've then got all the various shocks that seem to be happening around the globe with greater frequency and greater teleconnectedness, COVID being one, uh, global financial crises, uh, natural disasters, particularly in this part of the world, um, and geopolitics and, and terrorism, let alone things like um, Ukraine. So all of those issues and shocks interact with the climate uh, impacts and uncertainties as well to create a very difficult environment for making uh, decisions. So adaptation pathways is a, is a methodology which Nick and I and a sort of a community of practice ar around the world have been working on for the last 10 or so years um, as a sort of a solution to dealing with uh, effectively what we're doing, which is dr driving our four wheel drive along a cliff road uh, with a very steep um, rock wall on one side and a, and a chasm on the other and a lot of fog. Um, so Adaptation Pathways is really about how to steer that vehicle and make better, more careful decisions about which way the tires are pointing and at which point we, we um, 
uh, we, we turn left or right or, or go straight ahead. Uh, technically speaking, uh, adaptation pathways are uh, the proactive formulation of a series of decision points to implement a suite of strategies designed to address emerging climate risks and opportunities while maintaining flexibility to respond to unexpected future change. Uh, and there are various other de definitions, but broadly speaking, that's what pathways are all about. Um, diagrammatically speaking, um, this is a, an adaptation of, of, of a diagram um, from Ross Wise, one of our colleagues, um, where we're thinking about, if you like, a maladaptive space where we do not want to be and an adaptive space where we would like to be. But that adaptive space shifts through time um, with the changing climate and the other systems drivers changing. And of course, as we implement adaptation and mitigation measures, which will also change the, the, the option space, as we call it. And um, so pathways thinking is really about scanning forwards and then plotting out uh, pathways of strategies that will keep us in that adaptive space. Some of those might be no regret strategies, which are very simple, um, incremental, flexible uh, things we should be doing. But some of them may also be more transform transformational strategies, which we may require if the system starts to drift into the maladaptive space and we need to shift rapidly back to something more desirable. Um, and all of this is often guided by some sort of vision of where we want to be. Um, oh, I think you're on mute. How's that? Sorry, folks. Um, there are various different kinds of pathways, contexts uh, around the world and methods developed for those contexts. Um, and here's a bit of a typology um, that we'll quickly share with you. Um, in this case, looking at where, in, in, in the terms of the context, where power is distributed across many or few uh, jurisdictions and stakeholders, where uh, stakeholders' goals are contested or not, um, and where knowledge is either certain or, or less certain. Um, and um, I keep going back to mute. I don't know why. Sorry. Uh, one of the earliest um, one of the earliest typologies was was for the Thames barrier uh, on the River Thames in London, which some of you uh, will be uh, familiar with, um, where they've got a very simple sort of pathway system based on uh, sea level rise and then how they're going to operate the barrier according to the the, the different sea level rise um, situations. And so in that situation, they've got high reliability, a lot of knowledge, very few stakeholders. Everyone's got the same goal, which is to stop London flooding, uh, and the knowledge is pretty high. Um, and then um, another example, which we'll hear a bit more about in a minute, is is where we've got possibly more stakeholders involved, um, and uh, but still high reliability. And and I don't know if you've seen these before, but these are called sort of metro maps of a, a suite of decisions and where you might follow those decisions and, and switch from one to another uh, um, to, to shift from one set of strategies to another. Um, and then another is probably more in the uncertain space uh, with lots of stakeholders and lots of ambigu ambiguity and goals. Um, and this is more around sort of adaptation for transformation, which is more like the diagram I've just shown you. Anyway, so the point being that there are lots of different techniques being designed for different contexts and there's no one size fits all. And for us, that's one of the key research questions. And one of the exciting things is to test different contexts and see what sort of pathways approaches are developed by stakeholders to, to suit their particular situation. Um, the other thing that's behind this is some quite um, heavy duty social science around how decisions are made and uh, the values and the knowledge and the rules and how they in intersect to, to shape um, decision making. And behind that as well is all the power and the politics, which, as we all know, governs decision making as well. And, and that can very often influence how these pathways, methods and, and outcomes actually um, turn out. So quickly to summarise some key principles. So Pathways thinking is very much a shift from looking at problems, which is where we used to be looking at estimating impacts and vulnerabilities, to actually thinking about the decisions and even opportunities that are, that are presented in the future. Um, 
and climate change impacts are intertwined with and influenced by the social, economic and environmental system and the responses to climate change. So it's it thinks very much about systems rather than just a sort of linear um, impact of climate on X, Y or Z. Um, we want to avoid maladaptation. Uh, we want to maintain flexibility through no regret strategies. Uh, we want to see possibly a mix of incremental and transformational strategies. Um, but we need to understand thresholds and tipping points and decision tri triggers um, in order to figure out at what point do we shift from one strategy to another. Um, and that involves constant iterative scanning of the future and evaluation of your of your strategies. And very often, because climate change cuts across so many different sectors um, and across different levels of society, it should be probably a multi-stakeholder process, which actually is therefore an opportunity for integrating knowledge, innovation, systems thinking, social networks, and ultimately to hopefully generating leadership and trust and therefore adaptive capacity. So it's not just about the outputs, but also the process. So I'm just gonna hand over to Nick now to talk a little bit about his um, his work in agriculture in New Zealand. So over to you, Nick. Excellent, thanks very much. Um, so yeah, so as, as James said, so adaptation pathways have been used in sort of a wide range of contexts. And um, a couple of years ago, um, we started um, with some funding from the Ministry for Primary Industries, um, which is uh, sort of a central government agency, sort of equivalent to sort of Agriculture Canada. Um, we uh, we had a project that um, started looking at trying to sort of take this sort of work on adaptation pathways, which at the time had been really limited to sort of looking at coastal hazards and sea level rise, um, and apply that to sort of an agricultural context. Um, and so what we did um, was, again, we sort of, we developed a, a very participatory process um, that you that drew on sort of a, a lot of stakeholders. So we had um, uh, Maori, so indigenous um, uh, participants. We had um, uh, wine winemakers. So the region that we selected um, had a very diverse, has very diverse land use. So wine and viticulture, uh, dairying, um, arable cropping, uh, vegetable cropping. Um, so it was quite a, a quite a diverse region and, and essentially to sort of bring all of those people together to then identify um, both the sort of the range of options, but also to explore how those potential options um, either sort of created trade-offs or synergies um, and how they sort of um, also worked together over time. And so just a, a very simple example of, of, a, of the sort of um, pathway that, um, we looked at was um, so along in the in the top right that that diagram um, shows then just a very simple sort of you know the again we work with them um, using in this case we used uh, regional downscaled climate projections to characterize future conditions which for that particular region um, you know you sort of have reduced rainfall higher temperatures and more frequent variability and then sort of on the on the y-axis um, a very simple sort of example um, showing the different types of adaptation options. So you can, for example, you know, current practice, um, you know, will, will sort of business as usual will sort of um, deliver the outcomes that you want probably for the next, you know, in this diagram for another sort of decade or so. And then you reach that circle, which is a critical sort of threshold or a decision point after which um, you can see that that line turns gray and it becomes distinctly unsuitable um, before eventually it, it sort of it can't deliver anything at all. Um, and so at that at that decision point, you can, for example, um, look to improving irrigation, um, which can, again, provide you with sort of um, adaptive capacity for another sort of, you know, to sort of, you know, mid-century um, before you then might need to consider sort of more systemic um, or system uh, or sort of transformational changes such as changing pasture cover or actually changing land use altogether. And so so the the process that we ran, um, you can change to the next slide. So the process that we ran, we ran in we ran um, uh, sort of parallel processes in in two separate catchments. One was a one was a sort of a very um, steep erodible soils, um, sort of social and economic, um, quite marginal land as well as um, socially and economically deprived um, and very sort of um, vulnerable transportation and uh, 
critical infrastructure links. And then the other catchment that we ran the process in, uh, very, uh, very flat land, highly capitalized, um, extremely productive. And then we brought the groups together to then kind of look at at some of those sort of similarities. Um, and so the the sort of um, the adaptation route map that we developed then um, shows again sort of changes changes in um, climate variables over time. So that kind of reduced reduced rainfall out to the sort of um, later um, later part of the century. Um, and then the different adaptation options that they um, identified at sort of the sort of the regional scale. So for the while they had sort of a particular set of adaptation options for each of those catchments, we then looked at those sort of re we synthesized um, to produce a sort of a regional level map. And essentially what it shows is that you have sort of, as James alluded to, sort of these these incremental changes, you know, so yes, you can stick with business as usual, which will kind of deliver um, outcomes for a while. Um, but then if you're a um, if you're running a sort of a dairy unit or a livestock farm, you can actually start to um, do a number of things now. Um, for instance, you can look at adjusting stocking rates to better match existing feed supply. Um, there's sort of small scale on farm tactical responses. Um, you can look at your existing land use um, and even sort of change some small, small changes in land use to realize um, other opportunities. And then as you kind of move down, move down the lists of options, uh, the types of investments that may be required, both in time and capital, increase. Um, but they also deliver the potential for sort of um, bigger gains over time. And the, you can see some of those adaptation options beginning with established covered, covered production systems. Um, they actually are, are lighter green. Um, and that in this diagram indicates that you can actually start those things now. So you may not actually want to change to um, a covered production system in order to um, reduce losses from hail, for example, um, for another sort of 10 years um, because it's a significant capital cost. You may need to do some significant research and weigh up the, the costs and benefits. Um, but that work can begin now. And then when you do sort of reach a, a critical point, um, either when you experience um, concurrent losses or um, the value of your commodity increases such that you can afford the investment, or if you change varietal, for example, um, you've done the background work to realize that opportunity when it rolls around. And so this, um, this, then, um, this work on agriculture um, began in Hawke's Bay and it sort of has rolled out um, into other other um, case study areas. So we've got another project now um, working with the wine industry um, as well as the dairy industry um, in other parts of the country. Next slide. And uh, in New Zealand, at least, um, adaptation pathways is is now actually sort of increasingly, oh, well, it is actually part of um, New Zealand's sort of official guidance from central government. Um, at the moment, it's really um, only used in terms of um, coastal hazards and sea level rise. Um, and the uh, so local uh, central government, the Ministry for the Environment, provides guidance to councils um, on how to do a dynamic adaptive policy pathways process. Um, and so uh, local councils, um, which are responsible for managing natural hazards in New Zealand, then often run these sorts of, well, they're trying to run um, these sorts of adaptation pathways processes and identify uh, the sort of, you know, the, the different options that they have, you know, one of which is sort of managed retreat. So do they retreat from coastal areas? Um, do they um, build seawalls and levees to protect their assets? Um, do they sort of accommodate flooding? Um, through sort of adaptive management processes, or do they try and um, avoid the hazard altogether by um, avoiding planning or avoiding um, siting houses in um, flood flood risk areas? Um, so there is in New Zealand a lot of interest um, in how to do adaptation pathways planning, um, both at a, a quite a um, a technical um, and highly structured level, um, such as the guidance provided um, from central government through um, to these sort of more open participatory and collaborative processes, which are actually really about trying to build capability and capacity 
either with communities or sectors um, to do adaptation planning for themselves. Thanks, Nick. So what, what we wanted to quickly now tell you about is, is how we've applied this thinking to fisheries and aquaculture. Um, and um, there's an organization here called the Aotearoa Circle, which is which is a, basically a public private partnership covering uh, fisheries, tourism, agriculture, energy, um, trying to work through uh, how they get to a sustainable future for New Zealand. Um, and this project started with the seafood and aquaculture sector of the Aotearoa Circle. So the aims basically were to develop a pathways approach for seafood and aquaculture, um, develop bespoke pathways for three case studies, snapper, which is an inshore fishery, Hoki, which is a, a deep water fishery, mostly off the south coast of uh, New Zealand in sub-Antarctic waters, and for salmon aquaculture. Um, and the idea was to tr train the implementation group members who, who are part of the Aotearoa Circle in this methodology to try and enable them to scale this, this approach out across the sector. Um, and also we wanted to identify if there were or see if there are any key systemic barriers or opportunities that cut across these these three case studies, which if they dealt with um, or were dealt with, could have a potentially transformational effect or enabling effect on the, on the whole sector. Um, so the structure of the project was like this. And as you can see from the dates, um, it's we're only just coming to the end of it now. Um, and that's partly the reason why we didn't want to talk to you too soon, because we didn't have much to tell you. Um, but it, it starts off with pulling together all the current knowledge on climate vulnerabilities, impacts, thresholds, and hopefully tipping points from an ecological perspective, biophysical perspective. Um, and this is the traditional uh, sort of risk vulnerability assessment work that a lot of people have been doing. In this case, a lot of work has been done on fishery species uh, in, in New Zealand, like this report here. But one of the questions which is often not addressed is the tipping points issue. So at what point do some of these species or habitats change dramatically due to hitting a threshold and actually salmon is a very good example here because in salmon aquaculture we've had one heat wave marine heat wave recently which pushed seawater temperatures above their their um, tolerances and there were huge losses in one particular location so that's a fairly obvious example of, a, of an ecological threshold for one of these industries um, phase two was about identifying the decision makers who are the people that we want in the room to actually take part um, and then preparing all the materials and things for the workshops. And then we held the workshops in May, uh, one and a half day workshops, which to be honest is far, far too little, but it was it was a start. Um, and then we're sort of in phase four at the moment, writing out the results and then phase five, doing an evaluation any day now and looking for those common priorities and, and next steps for implementing um, or refining these these pathways. So we had a sort of a theory of change, which which we run through these processes, because remember, I said before, and Nick emphasized too, that very often this is about a process, not just about the outputs and the information. Um, so the process we were looking for was bringing multiple stakeholders together to generate social learning, knowledge co-production and systems thinking, which would generate almost immediately more trust, more, more coordination, more leadership better social networks and some innovative thinking. And then ultimately that would generate some tangible outcomes in terms of uh, the pathways, the key decision points and ultimately collective action. Um, the process, I won't dwell on too much, but we, we applied some social learning uh, thinking and, and um, uh, so human psychology um, thinking to, to these workshops, which takes people through a process step by step. Uh, called decision into practice and that really is the underpinning um, social if you like or psychological science behind these processes that we're running so we would run these workshops looking at um, six different sessions applying those different psychological steps session one what are the drivers of change for the region or for the industry uh, what is the future vision and goal for the region or the industry what are the possible futures using scenario planning to look at the uncertainties um, what are the adaptation and, and options for, for the industry? And then sequencing those into pathways and then thinking about what needs to happen next in terms of actually enabling that, all circling around because it's iterative, um, the particular uh, system you're talking about. And again, it's not just about climate, but more 
think about adaptation that achieves climate resilient development for the industry despite future uncertainty, all the other uncertainties included. Superimposing that back onto the diagram that we showed at the beginning, those sessions basically um, look at these different parts of that diagram. So quickly some photographs of what we did. There's a group of uh, decision makers, scientists, uh, government regulators, um, uh, in industry partners um, in a room together. Um, first session looking at drivers of change and beginning to rank what's important. And you can see here uh, planning policy and regulation. All those black blue dots were votes. Um, big issues here about planning and policy and regulation, in this case for the salmon aquaculture industry, that's that's what this photo is from. Um, whereas climate change is probably only uh, sort of second behind that uh, as, as an issue, despite the fact that they're losing fish uh, right now. Um, a future vision, a bit of fun with diagrams, getting people engaged, thinking about the future. And um, if people have fun, generally they, they learn and they remember. So I think that's quite important. Um, not that Nick and I are comedians, but we do try. Um, and then um, drawing future scenarios to think about future uncertainties for the for the industry, and then beginning to map out what are the options. Um, and in this case, the, these are the pathways or the, the sort of the prototype pathways that people came up with, um, working from left to right from the now into the future. Um, key decision points are those stars that you can see. Um, the, the strategies up towards the top end of the left hand axis are low regrets or, or low risk and those down towards the bottom are slightly higher risk and more transformational. And then this is really the cherry on the cake for us. So these are the infographics that we developed from these workshops to try and synthesize these pathways, riffing again off that sort of adaptive maladaptive space idea. Um, part of the reason we, we went for this is because the way that the the, the pathways came out in the workshops was less like the metro maps that Nick was showing and much more generalized. Um, and I think that's partly because um, a, a lot of the strategies are, are very broad, uh, not very specific and probably applicable to the whole sector rather than to individual farms or individual boats. So it was partly, I think, a result of the scale that we were pitching this at, which is a, at a sort of sector industry level rather than, a, 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 let's say, a firm or even a vessel level. Um, anyway, this is what we came out with. And in green, you can see on the left hand side here for the Hokie fishery, this is the deep water fishery, some no regret strategies. These are things they should be doing anyway which build adaptive capacity may not be directly to do with climate change, but will all together push us in the right direction with no regrets. Um, so we need a climate research program around Hokey. Very little is known about the impacts of climate change on Hokey. Uh, research funding system doesn't work at the moment, needs to be improved to enable that sort of knowledge. Adaptive legislation and management is needed to allow the firms and the, and the companies to, to and the fishery to adapt. Um, we need an innovation plan to help encourage people to start adapting uh, smart fishing practices, building human capital amongst the, the crews and, and the, the staff, um, increasing iwi participation, that's Maori participation who have rights in the fisheries in New Zealand, um, building social license to operate, because without that, it may sound nothing to do with climate change, but if the public doesn't want you to fish, that makes your life a whole lot harder when it comes to adapting. So understanding social license to operate and how to improve that is part, is basically adaptation. And value adding adds value to your, your resource and therefore clearly you have more resources to adapt with potentially. Um, but you can see these blue arrows emerging as well, which are the more transformational strategies which may or may not be needed in the future depending on what happens. But on those transformational pathways, you can see we've got some critical decision points. Um, so for um, the, the issue of fuel and diesel is a, is a big pressure with, as you can well imagine, with increasing uh, fuel costs at the moment, uh, that's squeezing the industry hard. But they so they really need to start planning now um, for alternative fuels. And if those fuels become available or if the diesel just becomes uh, unaffordable, um, uh, they're going to have to convert quickly, but they need to do the preparatory work now in order to reach the vision. But at the same time, there's a need to begin to think about diversification, because if different fish species move southwards with climate change, 
into the hokey fishery, then it could well be that that's a more efficient way of using your, your capital investments than fishing for hokey. Um, but you may also want to diversify into other blue economy initiatives like offshore aquaculture, or even carting seaweed to be dumped in the deep as carbon sequestration. So these are some of those more transformational ideas which would actually potentially shift the fishery away from being purely hokey fishery in the future. Here's another one for you, which is the salmon aquaculture one. Salmon, as, as we mentioned earlier, are already being squeezed in New Zealand. They need to move offshore. They need to have greater flexibility to shift infrastructure and pens around as temperatures increase and oxygen levels potentially decline and related issues with disease and, and um, uh, stress on the fish increases. Um, this is quite an interesting one because it looks to us like there's a very much a two, two potential directions for the industry in the future. And that all depends on this big decision point in the middle here around agile, agile le legislation being enacted, which allows the industry to be more flexible or not. And um, with that, uh, the approval for open ocean aquaculture. If all of that is approved and enabled, then the industry can shift much more easily offshore, can probably diversify into different species, including warm water species like uh, snapper and kingfish. But if it's not, they're going to get squeezed into this uh, much cl closer inshore, hotter, less flexible conditions, and maybe also actually having to farm outside New Zealand somehow. So this it is really interesting because it just goes to show for aquaculture anyway, because they're far less flexible than deep water fisheries. They really are being squeezed, but at some point there will become some critical um, decision points which will shift them one way or another, and they need to prepare for those right now. And lobbying was one of the main transformational strategies that was recognised they need to adopt. Underneath each of those pathways is actually quite a lot of detail in terms of actions, who's responsible, uh, when and what are the decision points and so on. So those aren't shown in those diagrams, but that's where a lot of the, 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 the devil in the detail sits. So lessons learned and next steps. Um, just a couple of slides here to finish off. Um, I think this is just a, a very uh, early reflection from us because as I say, we're at the end and haven't done a proper evaluation yet. Um, but clearly fisheries and aquaculture are relatively discrete compared to terrestrial systems. So maybe that higher scale of analysis is, is OK, um, whereas what Nick was showing is pro probably more relevant to, 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 to sort of small scale or, or multi scale agriculture. Um, this is just the first cut. There's clearly a need for some refinement. Um, I think the big questions about who is in the room. Remember, we talked about values, rules, knowledge, power, politics, all of those things probably need unpacking to understand why and how these decisions and pathways were made. Uh, we haven't done that yet. Um, the other issue I think is, is how do we scale out this process rapidly? Is, is it actually scalable or not? Um, or does it involve Nick and I and others going on global tours to, to get this stuff done? Because um, it's not quite clear yet what capacity our implementation group has to do this or the willingness either. Um, and finally, a really, really big question, which is worth everyone thinking about is, how do you embed uh, embed this sort of scanning and adaptation pathways thinking in existing management and planning structures for fisheries and aquaculture because it can't just happen once it's got to be happening all the time and we need to think about how we shift our, our institutional structures to enable that to happen um, finally just a quick reflection you remember this sort of typology diagram we've clearly sort of one way or the other shifted up to the top right hand red bubble there i think in our in our typology we haven't thought this through yet necessarily but certainly i think where we were the distribution of power was was pretty broad yes we had just industry people in the room but there were clearly a lot of non-industry people outside the room as well who have some say through the social license to operate at least um there was a lot of uncertainty knowledge which i was surprised about i thought people knew all about the impacts of climate change on Hokie and, and Snapper, but they didn't. Um, so there's clearly a need for, for more targeted research in that in that respect. Um, and I think there was there was probably fairly solid uh, continuity in people's goals in terms of what they wanted within the industry anyway, maybe not outside the industry. But um, in that case, 
again, we found ourselves sort of pinned in the top right hand corner, I think, but that might change potentially as the knowledge changes, um, as uh, uh, goals become more aligned and so on. And it may be that other methods are more useful, particularly at, at other scales within the industry. Um, so with that, we just wanted to say thank you. Um, I'm, I hope we haven't gone too far over time. Um, there's a crew of many people here who've helped us. So um, acknowledgements to them and the Ministry of Primary Industries who funded us. And just we wanted to then hopefully if there's time, kick it open for any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Nick and James. That was an excellent presentation and um, you covered